welcome to Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church this morning as we enter into our worship, our worship of the King. Uh, we welcome, as you just heard through our beautiful prelude, the choir from the Geneva School. So welcome as you help lead us in worship this morning. And we come to the time of worship recognizing uh, that God has invited us in. And he's invited us in through the blood of the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. And this worship service is not about us. It's not to exalt a single individual, but it's meant to exalt Jesus Christ as the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. So hear this call to worship, not to us, O Lord, not to us, but to your name give glory for the sake of your steadfast love and your faithfulness. Let's stand and sing.
Father, we come into the house of the Lord this morning recognizing that it's only because of the blood of your Son that makes this worship service possible, that through the blood of the Son, your Son, Jesus Christ, we're able to enter into the throne room of God, and now by the power of the Holy Spirit, we would be able to see and savor your amazing grace. So we dedicate this time for your glory and your glory alone. We pray this in the name of the one who taught his own when they prayed to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, glory forever. Amen. You may be seated. Well, as we continue to worship our God who has done great things, past, present, and future, we remember that he has conquered the grave, that he has broken our chains, and he has set us free from sin and from death. And because of that, he is our refuge, he is our strength, he is our very present help in time of need. And so let us go before him this morning with our prayer of confession. You can find the words on the screen or in your bulletin. Let us pray together. Father, you call us to draw near to you with clean hands and pure hearts, but ours are unclean and impure. Forgive us for defiling our hearts by worshiping created things rather than you, our blessed creator and Lord. Pardon us for attempting to find security and significance in our jobs, money, friends, families, and accomplishments. Show us your beauty so that loving and serving you becomes the delight of our hearts. For we pray in the matchless name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And now hear this good word from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. That's a good word. Thank you, Andrew. Soon to be Pastor Andrew. I almost goes to Pastor Andrew. Very soon. Uh, well, I'd like to uh, invite our families up uh, for the celebration of the sacrament of baptism. This morning, we have the opportunity to uh, have a family bring their child forward for infant baptism, but also have the privilege of two of our communicant members come forward and make a profession of faith. Uh, this is Eric and Tabitha. Eric's name was accidentally omitted from the bulletin, but this is Eric and Tabitha, and they are bringing Gabriel forward as a covenant child. And you are bringing him forward, uh, not only before your family, but also before your church family, and most importantly, before Almighty God. So I'm asking you these vows on his behalf, praying and trusting uh, that according to God's sovereign will and according to his divine grace, Gabriel will be able to stand before this congregation, God willing, one day and make a profession of faith. But I ask you as Gabriel's parents, do you acknowledge your child's need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ and the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit, do you? Yes. And do you claim God's covenant promises on his behalf, and do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for his salvation as you do your very own, do you? Yes. And now, do you unreservedly dedicate this child to God and promise in humble reliance upon his divine grace that you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you'll pray with him and for him, and you will teach him the doctrines of our holy religion and strive by all the means of God's appointment to raise him up in the nurture and admonition 
of our Lord, do you? Now, if you are a member of Coral Ridge Presbyterian Church, do you, as the congregation of this church, take on the responsibility of assisting the parents in the Christian nurture of this child, do you? wake you up. Yep, this is Gabriel. Can everybody see Gabriel? He's sleeping. We'll try not to wake him. (laughs) Gabriel, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. And I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father and our God, Lord, what a special day this is where we get to celebrate your generational faithfulness that salvation has come into this home, and Lord, we're praying according to your will that you'll bring salvation into the heart and into the life of Gabriel. Lord, he will not remember this day, but through testimony of family members and friends, through pictures and videos, Lord, I pray that you would even use this day to bring him to saving knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank God for his mother and father that are saying, no, we will not raise Gabriel according to the traditions of this world, but we'll raise him according to the truth of God's word and according to the principles and the values of the kingdom of God. And so, Lord, we lift up this family to you. Give them grace as they raise this child up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Overwhelm them this day with your goodness and your favor. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's welcome Gabriel to the family of God. He did awesome. Hey, Dad. Go ahead and watch that little head, right? Mm-hmm. All right. God bless you. All right. We get not infant baptism vows, but let's do these vows as well. So this is uh, Serena and Sean. They were up here just probably three or four weeks ago uh, when we had our communicants class. Our communicants class is an opportunity when uh, our students are at the right age uh, that they get to come before you and get to profess their faith in Jesus Christ. They get to celebrate communion together with their church family for the first time. And now they're, they're coming forward for baptism because you both individually have met with the elders in this church and you have said that, I don't believe just because my parents believe, but you both professed faith in Jesus Christ. And so for that alone, let's give them a round of applause. Because that's a big deal. And we talked about this in communicants class. It is not popular today to believe in Jesus. And you all are stepping out in faith and saying, no, I believe because Jesus changed my life, because Jesus is your Lord, and because he is your Savior. And this is a special day where you get to stand before not only your family, but you get to stand before your church family and a watching world and say that I am going to live for Jesus Christ from this day forward. So I ask you uh, these vows before your family and your church family and before Almighty God. Serena and Sean, do you acknowledge yourselves to be sinners in the sight of God without hope for your salvation except in his sovereign mercy, do you? And do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as the Son of God, the Savior of sinners, and do you receive and depend on him alone for your salvation as he's offered in the gospel, do you? And now do you promise in humble reliance upon the divine grace of the Holy Spirit that you will endeavor to live as becomes a follower of Jesus Christ, do you? And now do you promise to serve Jesus Christ in his church by supporting and participating with this congregation in its service of God and ministry to others to the best of your ability, do you? And now, do you submit yourself to the government and discipline of the Presbyterian Church in America and to the spiritual oversight of this church session, and do you promise to promote the unity, purity, and the peace of our church, do you? Okay, let's pray. Why don't you come? What's about, yeah, here, let's, let's do you first, Serena. Serena, child of the covenant, baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Father, what a special day this is when one of your children comes home and acknowledges you as the Savior of sinners 
and the only hope in life and death. Lord, I pray that this would be a day that Serena and her family never forgets, that this would be a day where she stood before her church family and said, yes, I believe in God. And that, Lord, through the pressures of life and the temptations of this world, she would remember that you are faithful, that you are the one that has rescued her from death to life. And Lord, would you allow the light of the gospel that shines brightly in her heart shine from her life by what she says and by what she does, that the whole world would know that she is your disciple. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Let's welcome her to the family of God. Congratulations. All right, big guy. It's your turn. Sean, child of the covenant, I baptize you in the name of the Father. I baptize you in the name of the Son. I baptize you in the name of the Holy Spirit. Oh, Lord, would you overwhelm us with your goodness and your favor today because Sean has come to know Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Lord, would you be good to him? Would your mercy follow him all the days of his life? Would he know that in Jesus he has a great Savior? Lord, I thank you for bringing salvation into his home, but now bringing salvation into the depth of his heart, that he might always know that he belongs to you, that you are forever his God, that he is forever your child. Lord, would you bless him? May he be raised in this home, in this church, in this school, to be a mighty man of God. Oh, how the world needs men that are strong and courageous. Lord, give him the grace and the wisdom to do so for your glory. And it's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Let's welcome Sean to the family of God. Amen. God bless you both. Three in the first service, three in this service. They just kept coming. So praise God for his faithfulness to our church. Church, would you now stand as we profess our faith together, continuing in worship, using the words of the Apostles' Creed. Christian, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. seated. Over two years ago, our church, with the approval of the session and with the leadership of George Moritis and Andrew Nichols, we entered into a capital campaign that we entitled Generation to Generation based off of Psalm 145, believing and trusting that God would continue to use this church, use this campus, celebrating 60 years of God's faithfulness, but believing by faith that God still had an amazing plan to reach the city, region, and beyond for his glory and for his renown. We announced back in December that we were able to successfully wrap up phase one, and we celebrated that wrapping up phase one with a celebration Sunday in mid-December where we were able to say that we fully funded 
the Moss Center for Family, uh, the Moss Center for Worship and the Arts, the new Education Center, and the new Fellowship Hall uh, Lobby. But we also, in the context of that announcement of wrapping up phase one and celebrating that weekend, we announced that we would be talking about phase two. And so here today, for the first time, we are able to launch in officially into phase two of the capital campaign. And in the phase two of the generation to generation capital campaign, we are going to be solely focused on the next generation. Phase two of the campaign will include the Center for Children and Families, which will be built uh, behind the DeVos Chapel, the Gangway Student Ministry Space, and also the renovation of our family spaces in the back of our sanctuary. We are walking by faith and establishing a new faith goal for phase two of $10 million, believing that God will provide these funds and resources just as he did for the Moss Center for Worship and the Arts and for the Education Center that he will provide these funds and resources to reach the next generation for the glory of God and for his kingdom. But this morning, as we talk about phase two of the Generation to Generation campaign, I wanna focus just for a moment on one of the aspects of that campaign, and that is the Center for Children and Families. Thanks to a very generous donation, we already have $2 million that has been designated towards uh, the Center for Children and Families. So we are well on our way to building that space, which will be located on the north side of the property. But just like all of our spaces here on our campus and throughout the Generation to Generation campaign, we never wanted it to be about brick and mortar because if it was just about flashy new buildings, this campaign is doomed to fail. But it was all about what would take place inside the walls of these new spaces. What would take place inside the walls of the Center for Children and Families? You've heard the statistics before and they're sobering. We've announced that 72% of youth raised in the church are walking away from their faith sometime during their freshman year of college. We've talked about the sobering statistics of hundreds of thousands of children walking away from the faith every single year. We've talked about the record lows of biblical literacy, particularly with Generation Z and the millennial generation. And we said that when we establish this new vision for the Center for Children and Families, we are going to do our part to reverse those trends that we are praying by God's grace and by faith that God would use this church just as he has done in the last 60 years to reach the next generation here at the church, here at our school, and Christian children and families across the South Florida region to develop them with a biblical worldview and to equip the parents to be the chief disciplers in their home, grounding their children with a firm foundation so that when they go off to college, they're not walking away from their faith, but they're standing tall as champions for Jesus Christ. When we established this vision for the Center for Children and Families in phase two, we knew we couldn't do this alone. If you were here a few weeks ago at the Kingdom Come Conference, we announced that we are developing this new Center for Children and Families in partnership with One Hope Ministries. One Hope is a global ministry founded by the Hoskins family that reaches children across the world with God's word. And so we said, who better to partner with to reach the next generation and reach their parents than to partner with One Hope Ministries? When we went to Rob Hoskins and One Hope, they said, absolutely yes. We wanna partner with you to equip children and families at Coral Ridge and throughout the South Florida region to develop them with a biblical worldview and to ground them with the truths of God's word so that we raise the next generation of kingdom citizens right here in South Florida to go out from this place to be a beacon of hope in an upside down world. So we are excited about phase two. We are excited about our vision for next generation ministry and excited in particular for the Center for Children and Families in partnership with One Hope Ministries. I believe that there is a card in every bulletin, a card that, uh, that summarizes phase one of this campaign, but also announces phase two of this campaign as well. If you feel led to partner with us, 
uh, we would uh, consider it an honor and a privilege for you to partner with us as we reach the next generation of Christ so that we ensure that this church continues as a beacon of hope in an upside down world. Three weeks ago when Dr. Al Mohler was here, he said these words from this very pulpit. He said, evangelicals are never going to have this acreage on Federal Highway again. They're not going to build this ever again. It cries out there once was a civilization that would build that. Now you understand why I'm all the more thankful when I'm here, where the faith is continued, preached, thought, and where, yes, you need more workers in the nursery. The Generation to Generation campaign is all about the future generations. As much as we want to celebrate what God has done through this church, it's believing by faith that the best days are yet to come, that God has an amazing plan for this church. May it continue to serve as a beacon of hope for the next generation so that we are able to say that when we, when we leave this earth, that this church is continuing to stand strong for the next generation. We'd love to talk to you in the back if you have more questions about the Generation to Generation campaign or in particular, phase two of this great work. And at this time, would you stand and would you find somebody new and would you greet them in the peace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? as you make your way back to your seat, and as we prepare our hearts and our minds to hear and to read God's holy word, Lord, I pray that we would take this time to meditate and reflect on the words that our choir, our choirs will sing over us as we're reminded that Jesus Christ, through his resurrection and ascension, has truly been crowned Lord of all.
Please remain standing for the reading of God's Word. We're going to be in Hebrews chapter 10 this morning, verses 11 through 14, as we continue a sermon series entitled, I Believe, Authentic Christianity in a Secular Age. This ancient creed that we just recited, the Apostles' Creed, has stood the test of time, correcting error, and serving as the church, for the church, a summary of the Christian faith. And in the 21st century, we need to constantly be reminded this is what we believe concerning the Christian faith and the message that Jesus Christ has delivered to us. Each week, we've been taking a different truth claim that is recited and recorded in the Apostles' Creed. And this morning, we look at the truth claim that Jesus ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. And to look at that truth claim, we will study together Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. And every priest stands daily at his service, offering repeatedly the same sacrifice, which can never take away sins. But when Christ had offered for all time a single sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting from that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. For by a single offering, he hath perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. And the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our Lord, it stands forever. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus lived and he ministered for three years. He was executed, but on the third day, as we celebrated last week, he was raised from the dead, the glorious celebration of the resurrection. But it was after the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead that for 40 days he ministered to and he reminded his followers of their great mission and calling before he ascended up to heaven in what we call the ascension. Last year, we dealt with the ascension twice, both in Psalm 110 and both in Acts chapter 1. So we're not going to talk about the ascension this morning, but it is vitally important to understand that the ascension was critical to the entire work of Jesus Christ, that it's not just his life, his death, and his resurrection, but it is his ascension, because we talked about last year that he's by virtue of his ascension, he's not just elevating above the clouds, but he's ascending to his throne as the King of kings and Lord of lords. The act of the ascension is the coronation of Jesus as the king over all things. But this morning, looking at Hebrews chapter 10, I not so much want to focus on the ascension, but I want us to focus on that claim that we recite every Sunday that he sits, or he sitteth, at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, because it helps to answer the question, what in the world is Jesus doing up there? Have you ever wondered? What is he doing? Just sitting at the right hand of God the Father. Is he waiting for us to get there? Is he just kind of buying some time, waiting for the next catastrophe to happen? What exactly is Jesus doing sitting at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? We not only need to believe that this is true, we need to understand why it's absolutely significant. And to do so, we'll look at this great passage in Hebrews chapter 10, verses 11 through 14. The first thing that it tells us because Jesus is sitting at the right hand of God the Father, one, he's the one who is sovereign over all things. In verses 12 and 13, because Jesus has offered a sacrifice for sins, it says he sat down at the right hand of God, waiting for that time until his enemy should be made a footstool for his feet. When Jesus sits down at the right hand of God, as it says in Hebrews 10, it means that he's assuming the position of sovereign king over everything in heaven above and earth below. It means he's taking the throne of thrones and taking his rightful place as the true king over everything. 
You see, if Jesus is not sitting at the right hand, and he's not sovereign over all things, then you and I have no confidence. If we are simply going through life as independent creatures, hoping the best for the future, that's not much hope. But because Jesus has been seated at the right hand of God the Father, and he's assumed the position of the sovereign one over all things, we can live with confidence that Jesus, not us, not you, not me, is sovereign over all things, reigning and ruling. He's not just reigning and ruling while we're here in church on Sunday morning. He is reigning and ruling Monday through Saturday in our homes and in our lives and in our work. Everything we do, is Jesus is reigning and ruling over it. You see, the idea that someone would be seated at the right hand might not be significant for you and me this morning. But in the ancient Near East, they understood the power of being seated at the right hand. If you were seated at the right hand, it means that you assumed equal control and equal power. So when it says that Jesus is seated at God's right hand, he is being equated with God. That the same sovereign power that God the Father Almighty has, Jesus shares in that power. Jesus shares in that authority. He's seated at the right hand. And then in verse 13, this whole idea of a footstool was synonymous with absolute control, absolute dominion and submission, all things under the feet of Jesus. And it says that he will be waiting there until all the enemies are made his footstool. So every time you turn on the news and you're so discouraged, and it seems like the church is losing, and it seems like the mission of God is not at work, and it seems like the enemy is gaining a foothold, rest assured, no, Jesus is slowly but surely making every enemy his footstool. From the time of his resurrection until the time he comes again, he is reigning and ruling at the Father's right hand and he is actively making every enemy of God and every enemy of the church the footstool, bringing them under his power and under his dominion forever and ever. And I love that word until, underline that word, because that means you can take it to the bank. It doesn't mean we hope he will make the enemy his footstool. He will remain in heaven until all of the enemies of God have been conquered. It means you can live with the confidence that no matter how dark it is out there, that Jesus is reigning and ruling and the victory is sure. The victory we can have confidence in that Jesus is victorious and it's just a matter of time until the whole world knows. The reality is this, whether we do so or not in this life, we all will one day bow the knee to King Jesus as the sovereign over all. I said this before, but this certainly is good news for us, the people of God, but it's certainly bad news for the rest of the world, and that's why this message is so offensive to our culture, because we want to be sovereign. We want to be in charge. We want to be on the throne. And this passage tells us, and every Sunday we recite the creed, that Jesus alone sits at the right hand of God the Father. We are reminded that he is sovereign and we are not. But when you turn on the news and you look out into the world, it explains why it's so crazy. It explains why the world is in such chaos because humanity from Genesis 3 has been trying to usurp the sovereign rule of God. That's why we see crazy things like an attack on the biblical understanding of manhood and womanhood and gender and sexuality. And why we have legislators in Washington, D.C. calling the biblical defense of marriage and family just simply a myth. It's why we have people calling abortion health care and government having the power to shut down churches and Christianity continually being marginalized in our culture, it is all an attempt to usurp the power and sovereign reign and rule of God. But listen to me carefully. It is a fool's errand to challenge the sovereignty of God. It is a fool's errand to try to usurp 
his reign and his rule. He is reigning and ruling, and he has been advancing his kingdom on earth as it is in heaven for 2,000 years, and there's nothing, nothing that will ever stop it. And that is good news. Because he sits at the Father's right hand, he is sovereign over all things. The second thing this teaches us, because he's seated at the right hand, he's the one, secondly, who is interceding for us. Verses 11 and 12 uses the language of the priest. If you're new to Christianity and new to the faith, this language of the priest might be confusing. But the Bible says that you and I have a problem and it's called sin. And the way God took care of the sin problem for his people in the Old Testament is he established the office of the priesthood. And the priest would serve as an intercessor. He would go to the tabernacle and eventually the permanent temple and he would continually make sacrifice, a bloody sacrifice, on behalf of God's people. And he would stand in between a holy God and an unholy people, and he would intercede for them and make atonement for them on their behalf. And it says here that all the time, every day, the priest would continually make sacrifice. And the priest goes and he intercedes. But it says here that there's a new priest that has come And the author of Hebrews likens Jesus to a great high priest who comes. And this great high priest, just as the priest in the Old Testament made intercession for the people of God, this great high priest, a new and better priest, comes. And he pleads our case, not in tabernacles and temples built by human hands, but in the great throne room of God, whose maker and builder is God himself. And we are told that because Jesus is seated at the right hand, that he is continually, every day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, continually pleading our case before the Father. That's what it means in 1 John, in 1 John chapter 2, verse 1, that Jesus is standing before the Father's throne as our advocate, pleading our case And how does Jesus plead as our intercessor in heaven? He shows God the Father his wounds. He shows God the Father his blood and says on the basis of my blood and the basis of my sacrifice, your children are fully forgiven. Your children are fully accepted. You're fully, are fully and continually justified before the presence of a holy God. It means when Satan tries to accuse his children, it means when maybe we even sit here this morning and we don't feel like we are worthy to enter the presence of God. And because of our past sins, we feel condemned. If you are in Christ, Jesus is standing as your intercessor and he's saying on the basis of my blood and on the basis of my sacrifice, you can't accuse him you can't accuse her, that the condemnation will not work. That is why Paul was able to say, in Christ, we might be persecuted, but we're not abandoned. In Christ, we might be struck down, but not destroyed. Because you have a intercessor pleading your case continually before God the Father. It's the only thing that made this worship service possible. The only reason we have a right to sing and pray and look to God on Sunday mornings and throughout the rest of our week is because Jesus has made a way. You and I can't get to God the Father without going through Jesus Christ. And he continually enables us to go before God our Father as our great intercessor. We pray to God because of the blood of Jesus Christ, him interceding for us before the Father's throne. This is the good news that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father and continually every day intercedes on behalf of his children. Third and lastly, the truth that Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father means this, that he is the one who has fully accomplished our atonement. Verse 14 says that for by a single offering, he has perfected for all time those who are being sanctified. 
The priest in the Old Testament, it would, it would require offering after offering after offering in order to seek the forgiveness of sins. But Jesus, by his one offering, where? On the cross of Calvary, secured for you and for me and for all those that place their faith and trust in him, the full forgiveness and the full remission of sins that Jesus does not have to daily and continually go before the Father's throne making atonement for our sins. It was on the cross that he cried out to tell us die, which means it is finished. Nothing to be added to our salvation, nothing to be added to our atonement because Jesus sits at the right hand of God the Father and announces to the world that our debt, sin debt, has been paid in full. But it's interesting. If you know anything about the tabernacle or the temple, it was full of beautiful furniture, the beautiful Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread and the candelabras, furniture that would have been established in the Holy of Holies and the most holy place. But the one piece of furniture that's never included in the tabernacle or the temple is a chair because the priest would never be able to sit down because his work was never finished. But in this temple that we read about in Hebrews chapter 10, Jesus takes a seat because the work is finished. In the heavenly throne room of God, there is a chair. There is a bench for the great high priest. And when he sits down, we can rest assured that our atonement has been fully achieved and our debt has been fully paid. Because Jesus sits, our salvation is forever secure. Because Jesus sits, we can always go through this life never having to doubt, does the Father still love me? And is he still for me? We can recite with boldness every Sunday, I know he does because his son has taken a seat. And that is good news. He sits at the right hand, sovereign over all, interceding for his children and declaring the good news that our sin has been paid in full. He is the incomparable Christ. And do you know him? Do you know this one who sovereignly reigns and rules at the right hand of God the Father Almighty? Do you know him as your Lord and as your Savior? There is no hope apart from the rescue and the salvation of Jesus Christ. And I plead with you this morning on the basis of his blood and the basis of his sacrifice that you would come and be rescued by him this morning. That you could forever live with the promise that you are a child of God fully secured by the blood sacrifice of Jesus Christ on the cross. Every world religion says this, the good are in and the bad are out. But Christianity alone says the humble are in and the self-righteous are out. Because if we're self-righteous, we can never be fully received by Jesus Christ because it's only on the basis of his righteousness that we are received by God the Father forever. So would you come and be received as a child of God on the basis of Christ's righteousness? No religion, no movement, no message like this in the history of the world there is no hope apart from Jesus Christ, and it's been transforming the world for 2,000 years. Julian the Apostate was the emperor of Rome, and it was his single mission to eradicate the Christian faith. And one day, pagan soldiers were beating a Christian, beating him to the ground, and as the soldiers were surrounding the Christian, they said, now where is your carpenter? Alluding to Jesus. And the Christian, beaten and bruised, looked up at the soldier, and the Christian said this, he's busy constructing a coffin for your emperor. Three months later, Julian the Apostate 
with a mortal wound in his side, took the blood from his wound and flung it up to the sky and said, thou hast conquered me, O Galilean. And he died because for 2,000 years, the carpenter from Galilee has been building coffins for all those that oppose his reign and his rule. Jesus will win in the end because he is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. Kingdoms and empires have come and gone, but Jesus and his church continue to move, continue to be the light in the midst of the darkness, and it means no king, no empire, and no president can ever thwart the reign and rule of Almighty God because he sits and he reigns forever and ever. We live in a world marked by death and discouragement and disappointment. And without this hope that Jesus has firmly taken the seat on the throne room of God, I don't know how you and I could ever survive without that hope and without that truth. To navigate the darkness of this world and the darkness of life, pain and suffering and persecution, discouragement and disappointment without the hope without this hope that Jesus is big enough to handle our problems, that Jesus is big enough to fix our broken marriage, Jesus is b big enough to rescue our prodigal children, that Jesus is big enough to bring hope and healing to a broken world and society. Why? Because he's taken a seat at the right hand of God the Father Almighty, and for you and for me, that is good news. Let's pray. Father, Lord, who would have ever thought that the simple truth that you have taken your seat could be part of the greatest news this world has ever heard. And for all those this morning that are in Jesus Christ, we can live with the confidence and the assurance through the hard of life, through the pains of life, through the turmoil of this life and this world, we can live with the confidence and the assurance that you have taken your seat and that you will win in the end. And that whoever is connected to you by faith, whoever belongs to the family of God because of the righteousness of Christ and his sacrifice on the cross, we will enjoy that victory in the consummated kingdom forever and ever. But if there is anyone here this morning that has tried every part, everything in them, to try to live as if there is no God, everything in them try to live as if they can reign and rule and, and they can be their own sovereign, Lord, I pray that they would surrender this morning, to surrender to the free offer of eternal life through Jesus Christ, that they would renounce their self-righteousness and instead look to the righteousness of Jesus Christ, that on the cross, our sin was poured out upon Jesus and his righteousness was poured out upon us. Oh Lord, if there's someone here this morning that needs this good word, that needs to understand that you didn't come to preach a good message, but you came to preach good news, good news of salvation, I'm pleading with you this morning, receive him. Because all those that receive him, God will give you the right to become a child of God. Not according to you, your work, not because of anything you've done, but because of everything Jesus has accomplished on the cross. Our great high priest, through his one offering on the cross, has given you the right to be called a child of God. So would you come? Confess your need of a savior. Repent of your sins and be saved and experience life to the full, both now and forevermore. And it's in Jesus' name I pray this prayer. Amen. If you're here this morning and you want to enter into a new relationship with Jesus Christ, understanding that it's only by faith alone that you can be saved, members of our prayer team, myself included, will be in the back. Please do not leave here today without pulling somebody aside and saying, today's the day I want to believe. Today's the day I want to place my faith and trust forever 
in Jesus Christ. Well, as we close, let's sing that great hymn of the faith and respond by faith in what we just talked about. Let's sing the hymn together, Jesus Shall Reign. benediction, a good word from our God. May the Lord bless you and may he keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. And may the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace now and forevermore. Amen.
Thank you for worshiping with us at Coral Ridge. We are a gospel-centered church that equips culture-shaping Christians. For more information on the church and our upcoming events, visit crpc.org or download the Coral Ridge app available in the App Store. To give to the ministry here at Coral Ridge, visit crpc.org give. You can also mail checks to the address below. Check out the Institute for Faith and Culture online at institutefc.org, where you can find resources such as articles, podcasts, classes, and more, all to equip Christians to stand for biblical truth in this cultural moment. From wherever you're watching, thank you for joining us today.